palpating the abdomen on our skeleton model, Lauren. We don't have a human body because we're not doctors or chiropractors yet. And so this is a part of physical examination. And all you need really is your hands, unless you do the auscultation part, in which case you're going to need your stethoscope. So I'll go ahead and I'll get that out. So my medical bag. Alright, so we're going to be doing abdominal inspection, auscultation, palpation of superficial and deep. Then we're going to do the liver percussion, liver palpation. Then we're going to do the Murphy sign. And then we'll do the spleen palpation, spleen percussion, Rolfsing sign, psoas sign, obturator sign, kidney palpation, jar test, and then the Murphy's punch. So Murphy's sign is actually for the gallbladder. They used to call it Mc. Oh, yeah, actually McBurney's is uh, the op is for the um, similar to the Rolfsing sign in detecting the appendix, the appendix rupture or inflammation, some type of injury to the appendix, and the jar test. I just put that before Murphy's punch because it's one that you can do while they're still on their back. Murphy Sponge is only one seated. Okay, this will be fun. Sorry, I was just having so much taffy and I went into a sugar stupor and then I, I made coffee and I only had a little sip because it's too hot. So I'm going to just put this here and I'll just get my stuff to scope out. Oh yeah, feeling it. Yeah, so this is actually made a lot easier. I just pick it up using the Velcro. Sometimes when I'm using this, I think it's a little bit um, misplaced. Alright. And so we're not going to be needing any of this other stuff today, not for the abdominal palpation. We don't do all of these physical examinations on every person. But let's say somebody came in with some complaints of abdominal pain. What you need to know is where the organs are, but then they can also have radiating pain. You do your normal history intake, which includes um, DCAP, BLTS, which is deformities. Oh, okay, actually, I went into another neural mass, and I want to make this a short, condensed test. You would actually do your intro, you would do your history, which is the DCAP BLTS, the um, L O P P P P Q R S T, the FAIL MASH, the review of systems, and the activities of daily living. And then um, from there, you would have additional questions to point to the direction of what could be causing this pain, but you should also have a thorough understanding of anatomy, visceral anatomy. And know that if it is abdominal pain, it could be many things based on where the organs are, um, what is happening with the person as a whole. So on the abdominal inspection, you would look at their skin overlaying <laughs> a normal person. And um, you would have their belly button about right here around... Um, this level right here between the, the hips and the lower ribs. Um, it actually gets inter innervated by T10, which is up here, but obviously we're not going to have our belly button right underneath the sternum. So um, it's about right here, body-wise. To make them comfortable, they would be gowned and you would disrobe them. Only what you need to disrobe to palpate the abdomen. Um, a pillow bolster. I have a little foam roller that I just bought 
than five below for five dollars. That's pretty cool. Um, because I already had that huge one right there. Too big. I didn't really want to use that. And um, she's comfortable. She has a retro lordosis. I didn't put a pillow under her because it just actually ended up lifting her like like this much off the table. So we're gonna do the abdominal inspection. We're gonna look for purple stria, which are like purple stretch marks. That could indicate that she has Cushing's disease, which is a kidney adrenal dysfunction, also a pituitary related adrenal dysfunction due to the adrenal corticotropin releasing hormone that's released, dysfunctioning and irregularity with her kidneys. That's it about right here. And you can actually palpate the kidneys. We'll get to that later while she's on her back. You might feel them only if she has a problem or she's very thin. She's very thin, but um, that would be the only way. And usually it would be more on the right than the left. Even though the right has the liver right above it, the left. Well, actually, I believe it is actually the left instead. There are instances where someone can have in side two in side two. Um, in situs, oh, I forget what it's called, but it's, um, where it's, the organs are actually on the other side. I don't know how that happened. And they say it's 3% of the population, yet nobody I met has ever encountered that, that instructs me on that content from their years, decades in the business. So, it's out there, but not in our 3% of random samples, not from our random sampling of populations. Maybe they're just healthier than us, who knows. Maybe they just don't like doctors because they've always been misdiagnosed. <laughs> Alright, so, um, yeah, so here's what we're going to have. They divide it into four quadrants for the abdomen. So I'm going to put the scan a little bit so you can see. It's a little bit slow. No, you can see that. I'll make sure you can see it in. Okay. So it's about right here. Horizontal line. And then on the line. The right upper quadrant. The left upper quadrant. The left lower quadrant. And then the right lower quadrant. The right lower quadrant. You're going to have the ascending colon come up where the appendix is right here. And there's also the cecum, and that's where the, the small intestines after they're done milking all the viral nutrients out and um, using their antibodies to disinfect and destroy pathogens that they are able to. It goes into the large intestine. Where the large intestine will bring it up, the ascending colon, to the hepatic flexure, which is actually just the bend where it meets the liver. The liver is under here. The diaphragm is right here. So what you have is you have the diaphragm. But then you have the liver right underneath it. And it's actually going to be higher up. The right kidney is also higher. Lower because the... Well, what I mean to say is the diaphragm is higher on the right than the left because there's hemis hemispheres of the diaphragm. And then you have the liver right here. It's like it's gonna be like this shape. Like this. And they say a normal span is six to twelve centimeters. We're gonna palpate up and then down from the fifth intercostal space to get a size palpation of the liver. And then the colon, once it's right here underneath the liver. There's also the gallbladder that sits right here and the liver. We go across as the transverse colon. Transverse colon has the splenic flexure, which is just the bend here. And at this point, the large intestine is mostly gas, fecal matter, and fluid. So you'll hear bowel sounds. When you're into the smaller intestines, there's not a lot of gas in the small intestine. Um, a lot of stuff is actually milk of its nutrients, vitamins all the hip, the enzymes from the pancreas and the gallbladder for fats, fat enzymes to break down fats, enzymes from the pancreas to break down fats and proteins and carbohydrates, 
Carbohydrate digestion starts in the mouth from saliva and amylase to break down carb goes down the esophagus into the stomach, the stomach turns it, it um, pushes it into the duodenum, duodenum at that point is where the gallbladder juices that are bile that, that break down fat and create cholesterol for our, our hormones and also for our fat cells that we need in repairing for the cell membrane. Um, as well as the pancreatic juices, they come together in the duodenum, which is the first part of the small intestine after the stomach empties food. So right there in that little duodenum, you have it come up and goes down. You have mic, you have villi, and you have microvilli, and then you have a thing called celiac disease if the microvilli aren't working properly, and you get malnourishment, which can lead to a very thin individual, can lead to diseases sickness, they can't process many um, vitamin dependent um, proteins, so they end up malnourished and sick, they could have um, vitamin D deficiencies. Um, but the celiac that are in the microvilli, because you have the villi like this, you know, like your finger, and then imagine your fingers have tiny little, little, little tiny fingers <laughs> all around those of the microvilli. In the microvilli, right between each little tiny finger, like if you had on, or just wrap them around, are um, little tracts. And from those little tracts, those little cilia, they push around the food nutrients, they agitate, they're kind of just agitating all that emulsification of fat, proteins, and carbs. And then you got these, the, the arteries and the veins, they're taking that, the agitated stuff that's just going around and they're putting it into the bloodstream. Or they're taking it out and seeing it, recycling it. But then you also have the lymphatics, the lacteals, which are the lymphatics in the microvilli. They go in between the crypts. They're called crypts. A certain crypt. It's like a German name. I'm not gonna say the name because I honestly don't know. I don't want to get it wrong. They, they are crypts. So they're tiny little, the little um, grooves where the lacteals come in, and then they just suck up all that fat all the excess fat that gets floating around like it does and it just takes it through the lymphatic system and then brings it into the digestion, the circulation from there that's how you get your nutrients but the rest of the food that's that it's not emulsified it goes down the duodenum and it goes up and then it goes into the jejunum the jejunum is tiny and it, it like helps uh, with your um, microbiota, gut biota, takes up any excess nutrients. It also um, will allow for let's see, yes, the um, uh, something with a P. They're like lymphocytes. They they break up Peyer's patches. They break up um, bacteria and they also have mac they have like this intestinal mac macrophages that go in there and they, they break up bacteria that they can. Um, you also get other bacteria giving you vitamins from there as well and so you have tiny little leaves within there as well. But there's not really as much microvilli but they can get the nutrients and then you just push that old food matter out. It's getting disinfected. I mean not <laughs> You obviously can't eat it or anything like that. It's just doing it so that while it's taking those nutrients, you're not exposed to them because you have blood supply bringing in and out from your intestines. And it goes down and then it goes into the ileum, not the ileum, but the ileum, I L E M, E instead of I. So I L E N, okay, instead of I L I N, like the bone. So then you have that one, and that one has some more bacteria. Um, just immune properties for cleaning it out but besides other um, nutrients that it might need whatever is left over and then it goes into this lower quadrant right here the right lower quadrant it goes up to the cecum cecum has some extra antibiotic type of properties some flora as well and then you have the this little appendage off of the large intestine. So that is the appendix. This appendix, they thought, 
um, previously was useless, but as it turns out, it is its own immune function. And they have recently found out that if you have a ruptured appendix, yeah, you might die, but they found out that many people have had ruptured appendixes and um, were just treated for pain relief and the body just sucked up all that contaminant or hardened it where it was and patched it up and they lived fine but it actually has um, immune properties as well that you need um, for fighting off infection it makes you stronger so you have a stronger immune system when it works properly and it can patch up itself but unless you're older than 60 or 70 years old your immune system is lower and in those populations there's a higher risk of dying from a ruptured appendix elderly also have what's called a higher risk of diverticulosis and diverticulitis osis means it's chronic itis means it's acute and really what that is is you have little herniations off the large intestine from not having enough fiber poop can actually harden and calcify and show up in x-rays from being hardened fecal stones they call it you can have fecal stones in your appendix that show up on x-rays and you're like what's that why is there a stone there what is that is that a urine stone because it's so close to it is that like a kidney stone or oh, maybe it's just a hairy version of a little kidney nope it's a, it's a fecal stone which means it's hardened poop which is just fecal matter that didn't get pushed up and got stuck so you should always hide it because then also when it's going up to this large intestine <laughs> the ascending colon to the hepatic flexure transverse colon splenic flexure down into the sigmoid colon which is s shaped like this and then um, into the rectum and then you have your own things by the autonomic nervous system that just tells you when to poop or not unless you're sick and then you just hit evacuate and click for you but that can happen when you're sick okay so um appendicitis can be in the right lower quadrant um, you can also have ovarian tumors you can have a tumor in your uterus if you're a female ovaries and uterus are for the female um, the bladder also sits along that area as well the ascending colon to the hepatic flexure you could just be dehydrated and have um, a lot of poop backed up feces C- 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 backed up and actually we've seen this on an x-ray the the colon can get very 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 large it can be so unbelievably large that it has something on x-rays from back to colon that doesn't have enough water over time all that feces just accumulates they call it the coffee bean colon but it's so huge it's like a giant coffee bean on the x-ray and you're lucky if you can even get gas out of it but you can actually palpate for all of this stuff with this abdominal um, physical exam. I'll get to that. So, right upper quadrant, you have the liver that sits down right here. You have the gallbladder. So if it's inflamed, it'll be tender to touch. Same with the liver. Liver can get enlarged from hepatitis, hepatocellular carcinoma, and cirrhosis. Cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma won't necessarily be tender to the touch, but they will feel larger than 12 centimeters or lower. A lower liver could also be if they have a barrel chest from COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which is they struggle to get air out because um, they're choking on their own carbon dioxide from long-term smoking use or um, exposure to toxic gases over time they can do that cause COPD and then another liver enlargement that is painful is hepatitis hepatitis is painful so there you know you just put your hand under your your liver and I'll get to that and breathe in and breathe out and, and you can start palpating your liver and if it if it's tender like very tender like very painfully tender not just tender like ooh, ow that hurts but like ah like you know you want to jump up out of your seat yeah you probably have hepatitis because that seems to be what it is and hepatocellular and cirrhosis will be abnormal to the touch they won't be smooth Hepi- hepatitis will be smooth okay 
So you have the liver, you have the lower, you have the gallbladder that hangs off of it and it will hang even lower if it's very enlarged. You have your duodenum where all the enzymes come together, pancreas right here behind the stomach, the stomach right here in front of the pancreas, pancreas comes up behind it, stomach right here, gallbladder in that duodenum right about here. That's where you're getting all your digestion, all that nutrient that you need. So if you have celiac disease, you should fix that um, by eating a diet that controls it or taking the right medications because it is something that can be controlled as long as you don't have some other protein deficiency processing or liver disease that's the reason for your celiac disease. Um, make sure you, or if you know you can't afford to eat nutritiously, that can happen as well. Um, some people say it's because of GMOs, genetically modified foods. Um, some people have genes. Recently they have discovered genes for celiac disease that not everybody who eats GMOs is going to get celiac disease, but those people with that g disease for um, gluten, they don't, pro they don't have enzymes that convert down gluten, so they have to stay away from it, which is really just um, oats, barley, rye, okay, um, and then, you know, genetically modified foods just in case. So then you have in this one, you also have parts of the tail. Now you have the head and neck of the pancreas right here. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's how it is. Yeah, because tail right here. And then you can palpate the right kidney right under there. Um, you can palpate the hepatic structure of the colon, see if there's any blockages. And then you can also go look, um, part of the stomach as well. So um, then you go to the left upper quadrant. You have the left kidney. You have the spleen above that. You have the tail of the pancreas in front of the spleen. And you have the stomach in front of the pancreas. Any tenderness there could flare up on the left upper quadrant. When you go down to the left lower quadrant, this is where a lot of people that have um, ulcerative colitis, this part of the intestine, the left-sided intestine, they can say is like a steel pipe because there's no real grooves. There's none of that. Um, the grooves that are in it to push it around as it goes one way, the other way, and so it moves it along. It's just a steel pipe, it's like solid, so that it's relying this way on anything this way to propel the their poop down and out and they get ulcers in their colon. Um, also if you have diverticulitis, which is acute um, polyps that hang off of your large intestine, they can um, enlarge and start being infected and cause pain. They can rupture too and that could lead to a, um, an infarct in your colon. Recently, there was a story about a prisoner who complained of pain, but nobody listened to him, and then he died in front of them, and then they announced to the world that he died of a perforated colon. So, I mean, that's, that sounds very derogatory, <laughs> but a perforated colon can happen from not pushing feces out. Of course, it could happen the other way as well, just having too much air and anything enlarging it. But um, uh, the diverticulitis, what happens is they enlarge, they push off that superficial, just like an aneurysm or a dissection. Not really a dissection of the artery, because it goes within the layers, like along the movement of the artery, within the layers, until it, it enlarges and then explodes. An aneurysm, it goes into one layer, it pulls up blood like this along the running artery, and it just gets bigger and bigger. All the while, like a balloon, it takes from its neighboring adjacent tissue until it's so big it just bursts, and then all this blood leaks out. Same with the colon. It has layers too, but at a larger scale. You have the muscular layers, you have like different directional layers, like. Um, you know, like vertical, but like 45 to another opposite for uh, and, and so longitudinal and circulatory, so that you 
it contracts it's based to push it out and then longitudinal as well so that it can make sure it goes a certain way and then if you have these little things pushing on that you know, the tissue the water gets in there starts growing you start getting pain because if it gets so large that it it um, traps the outer layer where the nerves are the nerves seem to be all around the per the um, nociceptors, which are for pain generators in the body, seem to all be around the capsule, all the outer edge. So if you got any swelling, any kind of damage, inflammation, that's why inflammation hurts. It is swelling up so that it, it's like a porcupine. It excites those nociceptors. Those nociceptors are firing off and it's giving you pain. So you can crouch down in a little ball into the fetal position and then try to make it smaller and just baby yourself um, until you get help. And then in some cases, if you're young and healthy, you can just do that for a while. Cry it out, soak it out, pain, whatever, and then you can heal. It's amazing, isn't it? It's wonderful. The body is a self-replicating healing vessel. Uh, that's what my chiropractor told me in the first place. Nobody has really said that. Um, in school for chiropractic but it is so it depends on your age your chances what you got going on for you what lemon life gave you <laughs> so whatever you have make sure you work with it um so you can have diverticulitis um they also say that the new generation of colon cancer affecting the young happens in the left side and what happens is in the intestine you can get from those same things pushing you see that you can get like nerve damage something can happen not supplying it not supplying you can have infarcts in your colon from blood supply not going to it let's say you have like a big big belly or trauma scar tissue somehow it just inside there you forgot about it it was like years already well the colon didn't wasn't getting blood so just like muscle <laughs> that is in the colon it died. It died of not doing its job. And so, um, it could have had an infection, it could have sugar cancers going up to it, the microbiota could have been deformed, it could just be dead. But anyways, what happens is, you get this dead colon tissue, and you get what's called an apple core. Apple core. So you got something that can go like this, and then your colon's going to squeeze in all that mass through a tiny little hole, so that whenever you look at it, on x-ray, if you get in uh, a special bell CT, it's actually, in, yes, I think it is a, you can get a certain kind of x-ray where they insert gas into you, but they literally have to have you sort of tool in you where they put gas in you that's like hydro, it's like uh, radio, not radioactive, but it's something that they can see on the film, and then it takes screenshots different screenshots, x-rays, and it can look at how your, your colon is moving through, so it's seeing if what's moving, what's what, and if something's staying small the whole time, that's called an apple core, it looks like an apple core on that um, film, and that can lead to cancer, because what happens is you got that backup, backup of feces, <laughs> and um, you also have dead tissue, it's susceptible now to infection because you got macrophages, you got bacteria looking for a place to hide from macrophages, macrophages might not recognize the dead tissue as infectious and then everyone else is like, oh, free game, free game, and that's like a water and cool for cancer. So cancer will eat it and then it'll start spreading and then you end up getting left side of cancer in young people. They don't know why it is, but young people are getting it. We can assume it's from this diet, the Western diet. Could be energy eaters, could be all this processed food, could be snacks, it could be stress because everybody wants to go to school and work and do stressful things. Who knows what it is, but they're getting it. And stress is good. So um, that's on the left side, the red colon. Right then you can also have the ovary, the left ovary, the part of the uterus over here. The pan uh, ureters. If you have ureters, it could be on the along the spine in all the columns. Um, so it would would be in the left, the right, and the left lower quadrant. 
and then some of the right and left upper quadrant. You have the bladder sits right about here. And that could also be in the right lower quadrant, left lower quadrant. But for our palpations, we're going to stick to tumors, um, carpet medusa, hernia, striae, scars, ascites, and pregnancy. Okay, caput medusa. Let's go with that one. So you can visually inspect. If they have an accumulation of veins, that are just like gnarly looking veins on their stomach, like you shouldn't even see veins, that could be caput medusa. If you have bruising around the umbilicus, that could be a sign of a hemorrhage from a peritoneal infection or a hemorrhage inside your person's gut showing up around the, the um, belly button. Purple striae, cortisol, cortisol deficiency, too much cortisol specifically. They'll have the moon face, the wide torso, belly, skinny limbs. And um, that is from a pituitary or an adrenal dysfunction. Actually, it's just both. And then um, you're also going to be looking for scars. You say any recent surgeries they forgot about. Um, or, you know, um, other stuff they took lightly that maybe could have been in mold. Maybe could have been in your nose treatment for cancer. Always a red flag when they previously had cancer and now they have pain that won't go away no matter what. No, miss it. no physician relieves it. No over the counter um, painkiller relieves it. And then you have ascites. Ascites is also a congestive heart failure disease, like caput medusa, where you have the gnarly veins. <coughs> we have the um, portal vein. It takes blood to the liver to detoxify, because that's what the liver does. And it's right about here. And then as it does that, it has this blood. And it's like a stream of river going through the hepatocytes of the liver, detoxing it and purifying it. And then it takes that blood and then it drops it into the vena cava. Not the superior vena cava, but the inferior vena cava. Inferior vena cava takes it up and it dumps it into the right atria. The superior vena cava also dumps blood into the right atria. Now if you have congestive heart failure, you have a backup of this blood. It's not making it there. You can have left-sided or right-sided congestive heart failure. Left-sided leads to right-sided. Most of the time, right-sided heart failure is something that happens subsequently to left-sided heart failure. Left-sided means it's not getting enough blood out to the body. Eventually, it's not getting enough blood here. We've got a little drought going on. Not enough pressure. It makes its way back up, not enough blood to go into the heart to set the trap, the sensor, so that it can open the bicuspid valve to go into the ventricle. The ventricles they pump together, the atria pump together, not at the same time. So then you you end up having a right-sided heart failure because it's not getting enough blood, or it's getting too much blood because it's not going into the pulmonary tract from this right ventricle when this vent the left ventricle so it's, it's like this so it's twisted at an angle you got the right atria left atria you got the left the right ventricle is on the front the apex of the heart is right here and you got the left ventricle in the back left ventricle in the back all part of the heart the chambers of the heart it's pumping to go to the aorta the aorta going down. We have an ear here, it's supposed to be two and a half centimeters average. Three centimeters, okay. If it's larger than three centimeters, it's not okay. But it's actually really not okay if it's larger than five centimeters. And what does that look like? Centimeters. See, it only starts at Four centimeters for this type. This one only starts at four centimeters. So we'll just see two centimeters. Two centimeters. That's how big your aorta should be right about here. Two and a half centimeters. Okay. Three centimeters. That's within normal limits. Now if it starts to be five centimeters in size, which believe it or not can happen. 
Um, that is a sign of some kind of arterial disease. It could be morphine sentiment stretch. It could be dissection inside the artery walls. It could be an aneurysm um, bunching up. It could be just plaque buildup inside the walls of the arteries. So just making it really large. And so what happens is when you're listening with the stethoscope, you're listening with the bell, the small sign, so you can hear the low pitch sounds of the water and high pitch with the diaphragm is for the bells. Um, low pitch, yeah, diaphragm you use it on the bells and then the, the lower sound are going to be the flow of the arteries and that's the bell. And so when you're listening, after you've done your abdominal inspection, for signs of congestive heart failure, Cushing's disease, um, previous injuries, previous surgeries, pregnancy, of course, they would have hard stuff. If you were looking and you just saw asymmetry on one side or the other, it could be a tumor, could be back up, could be hernia. You'd have to investigate more. So then we'd go to our stethoscope. So this is what I'm talking about. This is the diaphragm. This is the bell. You put these in your ears. And I'm going to show you something. You turn this like so. I don't hear anything now. Okay. You might hear it. I'm just going to put it right here. I don't know if you hear that. Let's try it. You can hear that? Is that just that's my radio? Okay. So you would put it here to test. Oh, shit. What is that? Oh, no. listen you can even palpate we didn't do the abdominal palpation yet though we're doing the auscultation first so we did it on the, the bell not the diaphragm so just listening seeing if you hear any sounds that sound like it's going down a drain or that it's a rapid firing spitting sound um, and then you're going to go ahead and go to the sides of it Right here, this will be maybe the right kidney, renal, the renal artery actually to the kidney. And this will be the left renal artery to the kidney. Then you would write about here. You go down, here's about the belly button. This is where, if you've seen signs of bruising around the belly button, it could be a hemorrhage inside the peritoneum, which is the lining of the abdominal cavity, which could signify a leak, some kind of rupture inside there bruising inside there. You go to the side of the belly button. And that's the iliac artery on the left. The iliac artery on the right of the belly button. And then you're going to go down to the femoral, where the ASIS is. On the front, you can feel it on you by just palpating with it. And then their pelvis is right here. You would stay out of there and move up to know. Halfway between there is the femoral artery. It goes underneath the ilioinguinal ligament, so it'll be kind of hard. So you can feel, you can actually feel right below this. There's a ligament right here on everyone. That's not all. It's called the ilioinguinal ligament, and you have the um, femoral artery right here, along with the vein and the femoral nerve that supplies the front of the leg. And then you would listen. 
find that little right there. Okay. And you're just looking for a normal sound or a normal sound. And you would take it to the auscultation part. Flip it around. And now I hear the diaphragm. The diaphragm is more for bowel sounds. So I'll just put it on. <laughs> so you're going to actually start in the lower left quadrant. You're going to go up the ascending one. And just put it in at least one spot in each quadrant to here. This is right about where the appendix is. Where all the poop is getting, feces is getting pushed from the lower small intestine, ileum, to the large intestine through the cecum and the appendix. You're just listening for bowel sounds. If you heard timpani, which is like air, nothing, you could hear borborigini, which is bowel sound, which is just, I'll show you. And then you going up into the other quadrant, right upper quadrant, you're listening at the hepatic flexure, so your resin's okay there. You can do another spot if you want. You can trace the transverse cone if you want, and then go to the splenic flexure in the right upper, I mean the left upper quadrant, and then you go down to the left lower quadrant, right around the sigma colon, and see if you hear any bowel sounds. So it might sound like, I'm going to put this right on my hepatic flexure. Okay, now I'm going to put this on my splenic flexure. And I'm hearing borborigmi. I'm hearing like water sounds. Okay. We're done with the stethoscope for now. So now we're going to do the abdominal. palpation. For this one, they're superficial or deep. We have the right lower quadrant, right upper quadrant, left upper quadrant, left lower quadrant. You're just going to take your hands, you can place them on top of each other if you want, and then you're just going to trace the colon superficially, seeing if it's tender, feeling for, actually just feeling around each quadrant to see if you have any hard, hard spots that can be a tumor, any tenderness by the patient, they'll let you know. That could be where the pain is, they'll actually let you know. And then you have to let them know to tell you that. Um, before any of us, you always get their permission and tell them to let you know if there's any pain or tenderness at any moment and to point to it. Okay, and then you're just palpating superficially, you're not digging in yet, you're just getting an idea of the symmetry just with the tips of your finger pads on each other, so it's not weird. Okay, because you know, they can have tumors inside the colon or so, they can have tumors inside the uterus, the ovaries, right around here in the, in the sides. Um, you could also have tumors in the bladder. Um, it could even just be from constipation or not having any bowel movements in a while, just being backed up and then stretching out and getting the peritoneum inflamed. It could be peritoneal infection um, from a cut they got infected, or it could be diverticulitis, diverticulosis, um, tender stomach infection. Uh, appendicitis right here, um, gallbladder sensitivity right here, indigestion, you know, stomach, stomach tumors, pancreatitis even, spleen, spleen, 
splenomegaly in large spleen after an infection it can get very large and it's good to not play any contact sports for a month so that it can shrink back to normal after an infection because it can rupture because it's not designed to be very large but it, it does get large after infection and also if you have a red blood cell disease like sickle cell anemia hold on real quick And it's still warm. Yeah, they like to say when girls say something on a, a chat that women and coffee. I have no idea what that means. I'm very certain it's offensive. But, oh well. Women and coffee. I'll just drink my coffee or whatever. Okay, so now that we did the abdominal palpation, superficial, we're going to do the deep one. The deep one, you're going to have them breathe in regularly, you don't change anything. You're just going to dig in firmly, but not too deep. And just hold it there, have them just breathe regularly, and then take it away. Ask if there's any pain. You can just tell them right now. I'm going to be digging into your abdomen. It's going to be firm, more firm than the superficial. Let me know at any time if there's any pain. I will be holding it there for while you breathe normally, okay? And then we'll just trace the colon. Move it. Hepatic flexure. Either way, it works. I'm not sure. Okay, so. I did miss on the superficial palpation when you were doing that you should have been feeling because you can just like you can feel your pulse on your radial artery by lightly pressing and your ulnar artery and sometimes your brachial artery if you don't have a lot of muscle mass right there holding it for like two to five seconds you can feel that you are size you start in the center right below the sternum until you can't feel it pulsing and we felt it two inch two centimeters is like this. Three is what you want to be in the normal window. The normal window. The window of normal limits. You're beyond that. Right here, you're really at risk of a, an aneurysm, a rupture, a major cardiovas a major cardiovascular event. So if you palpate and you're still feeling a pulse right here bilaterally and it's not the renal arteries because it hasn't stopped that could mean hey they might have something really serious going on that would correlate with their blood pressure too um if it was a lot of plaque buildup inside plaque or if they had a dissection aneurysm you have to look at their blood pressure because if it was dilated if they were on medication that's dilating it they could have low blood pressure and already be aware of it. If they're not on medication and they have a large one, maybe they have Morphin syndrome where a lot of the cartilage is elastic and they're very flexible, ligamentous laxity. Um, that happens because um, there's ligaments. Uh, there's a, a type of cartilage, the same one around the arch of the aorta that affects Morphin people, Morphin syndrome. Because they are so tall, they have um, hyper laxity ligaments, and the, um, the the ligaments to the um, the cartilage in the arch of the aorta that gives it structure can get too lax, and it can actually be so thin that it gets an aneurysm and they're just dying. That's actually one of the reasons they die really death is because of a heart. And it was an aortic aneurysm. Now, if they had an enlarged abdominal aorta right here, it would be called an abdominal aortic aneurysm triple A. And it's the very, and see, the aorta is right by the spine. It's right in front of it. It just follows it, just like the veins, the inferior vena cava, superior vena cava. So if you can feel it right here, pumping, it could, it could be like really large, quite large. It's just waiting to rupture. Um, yeah, so you would definitely want to head and get checked by a, a professional because that's outside your scope to really look at that. 
um, you would send them to the ER if you thought that, or to the primary care physician, depending on, on how dramatic you want to be, because you could send them to the ER, but they might just quit if they don't want to wait up to 12 hours in some cases to be seen, you know, so, um, if you really think it's an emergency thing, there's not send them to the primary care physician, just like if you found, you thought they might have cancer, primary care physician, have them refer them out to an orthopedic surgeon, someone on the insurance list. Um, because as long as you refer them out to get help to see that you are safe from being persecuted with malpractices because you didn't try to treat it yourself. And you didn't notify them, and you told them they need to do that because it benefits them, because they risk dying. Okay. So anyway, you have the iota right here to the side. Let's say it's right here. And you just palpate outwards, and then you should be able to also palpate the renal. The renal arteries are going to be lower though, so yeah, you can't really do that. But you can palpate the aorta. So let's go back to the deeper now, because I just wanted to go over that. So you're just pressing. No pain. They do have an abdominal complaint, so it's starting to get really suspicious. So what could it be? They're not working, they're not doing anything. But we're just doing the physical exam. We don't have a story to go with this. We're just saying, this is what you do at some point. They didn't let you know there's pain. And then you would fine tune it for that. <clears throat> if they said they had pain on the left, you could assume it might be splenic involved. They might have, you'd follow up with a question like, did you just recently get sick, really sick, where you couldn't work, where you were fatigued, you had a fever, you might have been contagious? Do you have sickle cell anemia or an anemic disorder? Do you have leukemia? Oh wait, but you don't want to scare them, because this might be their first time seeing you, and you don't want them to like not sleep, because they might think they have a serious disease, when it could just be after an infection, that their spleen just got, got enlarged, and it inflamed the... The sac around it, the casing of the spleen, where all the nerves are, and flare up, cause pain. But yeah, spleen again. Let's say if it was the left, the right side, could be the liver, could be the gallbladder. Many people have gallbladder issues because they have, you know, poor diets. They don't drink enough water. Many people don't. Plus, they're also high stress, not sleeping enough, so they're already lowered immunity. Gallbladder happens. Cholecystitis, they call it. Gallstones, you can't usually see those on x ray. 15% of them are calcified, and only 15% will be able to be seen on x ray. If it's a very chronic, long standing condition, they could get so bad as to have a calcified gallbladder from all the, the dead blood that just dies there. It goes, it doesn't get out because there's so many gallstones trapping it. At that point, they need to have it removed. <coughs> you can live without your gallbladder. You'd have to have a, a lifestyle change in your diet, though. And so, because it does, it's the primary muscle, it stores, it's like the warehouse that stores the bile from the liver. The liver creates the bile for emulsifying fat, but when it doesn't need it, what happens is you get a storage, you need the storage of the fat. And so they're usually told, hey, don't eat any fatty, greasy meals. And if you do eat, then eat in moderation. Eat like every hour or hour and a half or something. So your liver has time to make that bile to process it. Eventually each person gets used to their diet with that modification after not having a gallbladder because it was a storehouse for bile. And bile is actually, um, it's made by the liver. We need it to emulsify fats to give us our triacylglycerides and our cholesterol so that we can make our hormones and our fat cells and our um, cell membranes for cells for cell regeneration of all cells in our body and um so if you don't have a storage house for that bile normally if you did have bile only five percent of it is released from the um species and bile salt, so the rest of it is recycled. So the liver, that's why the liver needs a storehouse, because it's recycling all that bile. 
Now, if it doesn't have that soy oil anymore, because 95% of the bile that it you eat and digest and it goes out of your body is stored in the cycle, it's gonna just empty out. It's not gonna make it. It's gonna be overload. Living and be like, hey, stop eating. You're gonna have to start like pooping, like seriously, so it'll give the person diarrhea. They get diarrhea. They lose their electrolytes. They're losing potassium. They're losing phosphorus. Or calcium. Calcium and phosphorus work differently because you have the parathyroid hormone. It can cause other um, dysfunctions with bone, bone health, muscle health. And not to mention diarrhea is just uncomfortable. And um, it's acidic, so you get put in the state. So you have to eat differently. So let's say, let's go back. Right over clatter. That could be gallbladder, could be liver. Liver could be hepatitis. How can you get hepatitis? Well, hepatitis A, oral fecal root. Did you eat anything that somebody handed you that had poop on it? Like a dog. Did a dog kiss you with, after looking at its butt? Or a kid that doesn't wash their hand give you a cookie to eat that they made? I don't know. Um, hepatitis B, that's the most acute form of liver cancer. And 5% of the population is estimated. If you get hep B, you better find it fast. Because it is treatable. There's even a vaccine for it, I think. Or maybe there's not a vaccine. Anyways, this is one that was acute. You can get liver cancer as fast as three months if you're not healthy enough. Um, most people fight it off, though. That one is spread the same way as hep C. Blood, body fluids of any uh, means into the liver. It destroys the hepatic cells. It causes liver cancer. Liver cancer eats your liver. You can't regenerate it. In fact, if it spreads that fast, it could spread to other tissue. That's why people die when they get hep B. If um, they get liver cancer from it, and not not all type, not all hepatitis B is going to lead to liver cancer, but like in some select few population that does. Those that are immune suppressed. Yes, it's unfortunate. <coughs> hep C. How can you get Hep C? Hep C, same spread as Hep B, but this can lead to not liver cancer, but it destroys your liver cells, just like acetaminophen destroys your liver cells, and you need your liver for everything. It helps process many of the nutrients and electrolytes and proteins that you need. Um, it creates the bile that our body needs to break up and digest food so we don't get malnourishment. It creates the vitamin D that we need for strong bones and muscle health, the calcium. It helps process it with the kidneys. Um, it also has, um, it gets rid of uric acid, it cleans up the urine, it, it helps you from anaerobic processes where you're working out too much and you get excess lactic acid in your muscles. It cleans it out and it creates ketone bodies so that whenever you don't have glucose in your your body, you don't have glycogen stores, you make glucose in your muscle, in your um, liver, then you can go into ketoacidosis. You can start breaking up fat. Liver processes fat. It starts breaking down um, ketone body it starts breaking down triacylglycerols. It makes um, butyric acid, butyrol, and another um, um, product of ketone bodies. <laughs> and so um, that supplies your brain. <clears throat> and then you would have to be eating all the time, but at the same time, what would you be eating? Would you be living on sugar the whole time? Is it possible? You'd be having to have intravenous sugar water and electrolytes, vitamin D. You need your liver for everything. You would have to be hooked up to a machine to do all those functions and process and synthesize. Wow. So hep C, you can deplete the liver cells. You need a liver transplant. But you don't get liver cancer. Not like hep B. It doesn't spread to other tissues. So you can save yourself by being on the liver by getting a liver transplant and um, 
You don't really want to do that either because then you're going to be immune suppressed. And so you're still going to have to watch everything you eat because all your antibiotics and everything, you'll have to be away from anything fun. So then let's move on. Not the liver. Okay, so then we have the, the left upper quadrant. We did that. We did, did we do the right lower quadrant other than appendix? Okay, so you can have tumors in the, when you're doing the deep palpation, if there was pain, tenderness, if it's a benign tumor, not really so much pain, but it could be uncomfortable. Um, if it's a cancerous one, it could be very painful. Um, at any point, superficial pain, that could be peritoneal um, damage. You could have a leak in your gut or in the blood arteries. Something inside your gut thorax encased by the peritoneum layer that has inflamed the um, the interperitoneum inter cavity, which is another thing about the sort of like the capsule of the abdominal organs. So there's all the nociceptors there signaling pain. That's why if you have an enlarged liver, it can get so big and not be painful. If you have cirrhosis, it will be pain it won't be painful. Or cancer, not painful. Surprising, right? But if you had hepatitis, it would be painful. Interesting, right? Okay, then if you had ulcerative well, colitis, you'd have inflammation as well, so that might be the um, tender. Crohn's disease actually affects the whole large intestine from the right to the left. Ulcerative colitis, colitis is mostly left-sided, which is the exit. And um, that would be it for abdominal palpation. Let's see. Oh, we're really on a roll. It's only been an hour. Wow, that's amazing, right? Because I plan on only making this half an hour, and we only got through abdominal inspection, occupation, and palpation. Let's just not discuss anything else, and we'll just do the rest, okay? So, liver palpation. <laughs> liver palpation, okay. So, let's see. Okay. okay. Liver palpation. We're going to put our hand right here under about the 10th or 11th. Their arms out of the way. We're just going to let them know that we are going to be palpating for the liver. They would be closed and, and then we would just have them just right up below the receptacle area. Hold right here. We're going to have them breathe. We're just going to palpate under the margin right there. <coughs> Excuse me, I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that on a person. Go ahead and breathe. And then exhale. And now we're going to have them breathe again. And the idea is that we can feel the liver coming onto the tips of our fingers. And if it's sensitive, that could mean hepatitis. If it's really large, we could feel it even lower. It could be due to their body. Again, COPD, it could be um, having a large hepatomegaly from the cirrhosis, hepatitis, or hepato hepatocellular carcinoma, which is cancer. Um, we're going to do the Murphy's. That was liver palpation. Oh, that was liver palpation. I want to show you liver percussion first, though. So we have the person's midline, and then we have their mid-clavicular line, which is an imaginary line spanning halfway between the midline and the arm. We are going to palpate up from about the belly button, and to do that, we take our fingers, middle finger. We're just going to go up along, and we're just going to tap our finger until we feel dullness. And then we're just going to trace it to where we feel it. And then we're going to tap down from the fifth near not the bone, so you don't get a false positive. 
We got the fifth, so one, two, three, four, five, yeah, right here. And in between the bones, see if we feel any dullness. Okay, so we're going to see the liver's right about here. If it was lower, that could mean, again, hepatomegaly or COPD. From there, after you do the liver percussion, to do the liver palpation, you would start where you felt that lower border. Put it under the lower ribs, right here, face up, breathe in, and then you're just going to dig in and have them breathe again and feel the liver drop. If it's tender, that can mean they have hepatitis or hepatomegaly. Now we're going to go into Murphy sign. Murphy sign. Okay. So the Murphy sign is not the, um, because you know, I learned it as the Murphy McBurney. I'm reviewing this. I haven't had this for like literally like almost two years, but that's why I'm reviewing it now because it'll help me. And you know, too, right? Okay, so. If you were to do the um, McBurney's or Murphy's, I want to say the McBurney's is here, the gallbladder, because I like to think it as one, two, Murphy's, McBurney's, first up one, gallbladder, McBurney, appendix, lower. So Murphy's is right here. Now we're going to fill for the gallbladder. The gallbladder is going to be right below the, the, um, Liver where we palpated, we're going to just take our fingers like this. We're going to have them breathe in and exhale and dig in to their lower right at the midclavicular line. And then take another breath in. We've already popped in after they pop. And if there's pain or tenderness, that could mean they have cholecystitis, which is an inflamed gallbladder. Because as the liver is right here, the gallbladder is in between two of the lobes of the liver, and it sits here right around where the, the gut is, the duodenum is. And that could mean they have cholecystitis. So that's to look out. So with these palpations, you can tell early to help them out. So if it's early enough, maybe they can get treated for their gallstones before having to take out their whole gallbladder. Same with the liver. Maybe get antibiotics. They didn't know they had hepatitis until they found out. But hey, it hurts. And those are all treatable. All the hepatitis are treatable. Just a few of them have vaccines. I think hepatitis B and A have vaccines. And hep C doesn't. Hold on real quick. I could take some coffee. getting cold, not cold, it's room temperature now. So we did Murphy thing, now we're going to do spleen palpation. For the spleen palpation, I could stand right here. Remember the spleen is right here in the left upper quadrant. What we're going to do is, we know where the mid-clavicular line is. Now we're going to go to the axillary line. Axillary lines up with the armpit, but along like this, to the side. We're going to palpate from the midclavicular to the, um, we're going to percuss, actually, spleen palpate. Oh, wait, no, it's spleen palpation. Let's just percuss it first. So it's same with the liver, but we're going to start with the lower three ribs, the false ribs, right here at the midclavicular line. And we're just going to, between the bones, looking for dullness, a tenderness, and we're just going to, move around and see if we can feel it. Dullness, if it's enlarged, you will feel it. In most people, you won't feel it if it's normal. Now, let's do the palpation. The palpation. I'm just going to take my right hand. I'm going to hold. I'm going to reach over to the other side, the lower ribs. And I'm just going to take my other hand and push over it. And then I'm going to see if I can palpate 
I'm just palpating like this to see if the spleen is large, like splenomegaly after an infection. Could be about to rupture. If they, it was tender, they would let me know. I would let them know to let me know before doing that. If there's any pain, please let me know at any time. And then point to the pain. Now, you shouldn't feel from the mid axillary line. It should be no closer to the mid clavicular line than the mid axillary line. And right above here, if it's large, a splenomegaly, it will be higher up, more anterior in the front, closer to the, above the mid axillary line, but closer to the mid clavicular line, right here. And it could actually be so large that it's hanging low. So that would be your spleen, splenic palpation when you're feeling for the actual size of the, the spleen. Palpation was feeling for the dullness size by tapping between the bones. <coughs> Alright, thank you. And then let's go to let's do the Rossing sign. Rossing sign is for appendicitis. What we're gonna do is we're gonna we know that the appendix is right here, but as it turns out it's very tender and muscles are being visceral organs are um, attached the, the same nerve root and so what happens is the nociceptors they are the shared between it that are triggering the pain to send to the nerve root so we're going to just take our hand like this overlap it and we're going to place it on the opposite side let me know if you have any pain at any time i'm just going to press in your stomach and let go you press and rebound real quick and then because of the rebound it would hurt the right side which would indicate the rebound sign which is pain that lateralizes or is opposite <laughs> the uh, side touch towards the side of the appendix which would indicate a positive sign positive test for appendicitis now there's some other tests we can do also for appendicitis we have the solar sign so the sign is we're just going to take their leg. Because the psoas is a muscle flexor, and the way that the appendix sits in the pelvis, the appendix will be right here, and if it's only a plane that gets so large, that the psoas muscle, which attaches to each of the vertebrae and lumbars, into the iliacus, just contracting it is enough to irritate the appendix if it's inflamed. So we're just going to have them lift their leg. We're going to have them lift their leg at the hip. We're not going to actually do it for them. We're going to do it. Is there any pain? If there was pain, that could indicate a positive test for appendicitis. And then we have another appendicitis test, the obturator sign. We're just going to lift their hip. We're going to do this passively. 90 degrees, we're lifting those legs, and then we're flexing at the hip 90 degrees, flexing at the knee 90 degrees, and we're just going to take brace at the, the proximal tibia below the knee, and we're just going to externally rotate. Is there any pain? And the idea here is that because it works whenever you do this motion, there is an obturator externus muscle on the outside, right here, and an obturator internus muscle. Because of the appendix location of this real estate on the body, doing this could inflame and irritate the appendix. It wouldn't make it inflamed, but it could irritate an inflamed appendix. And they would have pain. Now we're going to do the gyre test. Wait, let's do the kidney palpation. So kidneys, yeah, we can actually palpate while there's a sign. You might not be able to feel the left one due to the fact that the liver could be hanging over plus the gallbladder. 
and the right one, the spleen, if it's enlarged, you couldn't fill it. But you're actually not even really going to fill this in most people. But if you could fill it, that could indicate that there's something going on with the kidneys. Now, if it's unilaterally, it could be renal carcinoma or um, something going on with the kidneys. If it's bilateral, it could be pyelonephritis or polycystic kidney disease, enlarged kidney. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and take my hand. I'm going to take my right hand. I'm going to be on the opposite side, but I'm just going to dig under the ribs right here. I'm just going to lift up. And then right here, I want to trap the kidney in between my two hands. So I'm going to now place my other hand on top of the abdomen. And the idea is that I am going to be able to push up on the lower back where the kidney is between the lower ribs, right by the lower ribs, which would be like T12 to L2, on that soft tissue and press up press down on the top, the front tissue to just use all that's in between it to brace that kidney and push it up. And then once I get it, I can move it around and if there's pain or if it's enlarged, or if I even can do that, it could mean there's something going on with the kidney. That's for the left kidney. The right kidney, same thing. Let me take this hand, my left, my left hand, put it under the lower ribs under the twelfth rib because the left kidney hangs lower so it will be closer to L12. I'll just put my hand pushing up while they're sitting up and I'm going to take my right hand and go down on the top or below the ribs and try to squish the kidney so I can palpate it. I most likely won't be able to due to the liver, gallbladder. You also have a large intestine in the way. But if I could, that could mean there's a problem going on with the person. Or if it's sensitive or sensitive. Okay, next we're going to do jar test. Jar test is great because now we're going to take this pillow out from under them. Or this bolster. And we're just going to take their foot. Just hold it. Hold it like this. And we're just going to take our fist and hit the heel. The idea is that when we do this, it will create a lot of movement that irritates the, ca the abdominal cavity because there's some kind of peritoneum damage that's already inflamed. So any type of movement irritates it due to those nociceptors lining the um, peritoneal cavity saying that, hey, there's some kind of noxious stimuli in my zone, I want it out. How dare you shame on you? I cause you great pain, I curse you, because you need to fix this now. And so anyways, that's what the peritoneum screen means when you do the jar test by hitting the bottom of the heel. That would be a positive for peritoneal um, inflammation. And then you would also have um, around the belly button, you could do some visual inspection. If you were to see bruises right along the belly button, that could also be an indication of a hemorrhage inside the abdominal cavity. You could just do the jar test right there. Go straight through it and see, hey, yeah, there's definitely something going on in there. Okay. And then we're going to do the Murphy's Lunge. This one is the end of the abdominal palpations. And it's only been almost an hour and 20 minutes. So we're going to sit this person up, lowering our skeleton model. And it doesn't matter as long as they're comfortable. And let me know at any time if you feel any pain. I'm just going to put my hand on your kidney and do a light tap on it. So I'm going to place my hand right here, right below the ribs. And I'll keep 12 L2. Take my fist and then just hit it lightly. Any pain with that? Okay, and then I'm going to do it on the other side. I'm going to take my other hand, place my hand flat like this onto the kidney. Take a close fist. Any pain with that? 
if there was pain. That could indicate that they have a kidney infection, some kind of a blockage, maybe a kidney stone. They could have a pyelonephritis, which is kidney infection. Polycystic kidney disease or cysts along the kidney and um, recently I, we reviewed more information on that <clears throat> and those things can get huge. They can make the kidney like really heavy. I think like I want to say 20 pounds but that seems ridiculous right? Even 2 pounds is a lot but yeah it can make the kidneys really large. And it happens bilaterally because it's some kind of genetic mutation or disease where they get cysts around the kidneys. But it's not going to be in a lot of people, though. Um, and to fix that, I think they just live with it because they still have um, renal f kidney function. They just have cysts on their kidneys, which is crazy. All right. Well, if you like this video, go ahead and like and subscribe, and I'll bring you this amazing type of content. It is amazing. They don't even want me to tell you guys, because it is just so top secret. It's super, super top secret. Like, you don't even know. Like, wow, you're learning so much, and it's so valuable. It's like, you have to have special privileges to know this information. Okay. Alright, remember to like and subscribe and I'll give you more great top secret information.